Day after day, we are surrounded by the presence of criminals. We are spectators to the deepest darkness in human actions and the bizarre reality that someone's suffering can be a form of pleasure. As dedicated investigators of the criminal world, we're on a mission to uncover the most shocking crimes and get inside the minds of those who commit them. I am Luke, and today I bring you another unreal true crime. The Case of Marianne Bachmeyer Marianne Bachmeyer was born on June 3, 1950, in Sarstedt, West Germany. Her family ended up there following the public persecution and scrutiny her father faced for being a former official of the German National Socialist Party. During World War II, he was a member of the notorious SS. As a result, Marianne was raised in a very conservative home by deeply religious tutors. It's said that she never had a happy childhood due to a lack of close relationship with her parents. Her father was authoritarian, abusive, and an alcoholic, often spending more time at a bar near their home than with his family. Marianne's mother was also distant, rarely speaking or spending time with her daughter. The situation worsened due to her father's drinking, which increased his aggression towards the family. This ended with the parents' divorce and the father leaving the house. Marianne thought she could finally be free and happy, but soon her mother remarried another abusive man. Unfortunately, instead of Marianne and her mother uniting against the man, they both turned against Marianne, blaming her for the family's problems. This broke their relationship and Marianne seen as a troublesome teenager, was eventually kicked out of the house. During her adolescence, Marianne faced multiple assaults from different men, leading to the birth of her first child at just 16. She was forced to give the baby up for adoption due to lack of resources and because the baby's father abandoned her. Two years later, Marianne got pregnant again by her then-abusive boyfriend. Despite the circumstances, she wanted to keep the baby, but before the child's birth, she experienced another traumatic assault at a nightclub. Her boyfriend left her, and she gave up this second child for adoption as well. Later, Marianne dropped out of school and sought work to support herself. She started working at a bar named Tipasa, where she met the manager, and after some time, they became a couple. At 22, she became pregnant with her third child and felt ready to raise the baby with some resources and a home. However, her then-boyfriend disagreed with her decision, ending their relationship. Marianne, firm in her choice, decided to raise her daughter Anna alone, despite her parents' demands to give her up for adoption like her previous children. After Anna's birth, Marianne vowed to be a good mother and underwent a tubal ligation, a common practice at the time to prevent overpopulation. Marianne and Anna lived together in Lübeck, Germany, and despite challenges, they made it through. Indeed, Marianne was happy because her daughter was the only person in her life who did not intend to harm her, unlike her parents or ex-partners. However, Raising Anna alone meant Marianne had to take her to work at the bar, so she could only attend to her daughter during her few breaks. Years later, people close to Marianne would say that she treated Anna like a little adult and expected her to take care of many things on her own from a young age. Anna often slept in the bar while Marianne was working, and a friend described Anna as a very vibrant and creative child who unfortunately never had a pleasant family life as she only occasionally saw her father at the bar. Some stories also mention that Marianne worked late into the night and then slept all day, leaving her seven-year-old daughter alone for much of the day. Anna used this time to play around the neighborhood alone, greeting people and playing with their pets. It was even mentioned that Marianne was aware of her problematic lifestyle 
and sometimes contemplated the idea of giving Hannah up for adoption. This leads us to May 5, 1980, where it is unclear exactly what happened that morning between Anna and Marianne. Some say they argued because Anna woke up in a bad mood and stubbornly did not want to go to school but wanted to play in the park, which Marianne did not allow. There's another version where Anna asked permission from her mother to skip school to play in the park with friends, and Marianne eventually let her go, not suspecting her daughter's real intentions to play elsewhere. Regardless, Anna was playing outside when the ensuing events turned into a tragedy in Marianne's life. When Marianne returned home later that day, she found it strange not to find her daughter anywhere but decided to wait a few more hours for her return. As time passed and Anna did not return, Marianne started searching the neighborhood. She asked Anna's friends and locals if they knew anything about her daughter, but nobody knew anything. It was as if she had vanished into thin air. So Marianne reported this anomaly to the police. The next day, a very upset and nervous woman arrived at the police. It seemed that this man, Klaus Grabowski, 35 years old, was overcome with guilt after the act and couldn't find peace. He ended up confessing in detail what happened to his girlfriend. This caused a great argument, after which he left, confused, to go to a bar for a beer. His girlfriend took this opportunity to go to the police station to report him. The truth was that Anna had been abducted by Klaus, who owned a butcher shop near Marianne's house. Anna had gone there intending to play because the man had promised her that she could play with his cats whenever she wanted to visit. Innocently, Anna went and rang the doorbell. Klaus received her and kept her in his house for several hours, assaulting her multiple times until finally. To prevent the child from confessing the facts, he ended her life by suffocation with a pair of his girlfriend's stockings. Klaus Grabowski had a history of criminal activities and had previously been convicted for the assault of two young girls. He was known to have a troubled past. In 1973, he attacked a six-year-old girl and was charged with attempted murder. Two years later, he faced charges for these crimes leading to a psychological evaluation. The results indicated he had an abnormal sexual instinct and significantly limited capacity to control it. Consequently, he was sent to a psychological treatment center instead of prison. A few years later, Klaus was offered the option of undergoing a controversial chemical castration procedure in exchange for early release, which he readily accepted this procedure involved administering drugs to reduce libido and testosterone levels, reducing the likelihood of reoffending. Klaus preferred this option over returning to a mental health facility. It was a common practice for offenders of such crimes, often resulting in reduced sentences under the assumption that they no longer posed a societal threat. Despite the reversibility of this procedure, Klaus was released soon after undergoing it without subsequent psychological evaluations. Two years later, he underwent hormonal treatment to reverse the chemical castration, increasing his testosterone levels. This treatment was approved by the court under the pretext that he wanted to start a family with his girlfriend and lead a normal life, thus misleading everyone about his true nature. On the day of the incident, authorities quickly headed to Klaus's residence but couldn't find him. He had taken Anna's body and left a note for his girlfriend, asking her to meet him at a bar that night to discuss the situation. The police took this opportunity to wait for Klaus at the bar and arrested him upon his arrival. After his arrest, Klaus claimed he had no intention of inappropriately touching Anna. He despicably defended himself by alleging that the child tried to seduce and extort him and fear of returning to jail drove him to end her life. He claimed Anna had threatened to tell her mother he had inappropriately touched her, a claim he insisted was false and made with the intent to extort money from him. Klaus revealed he had hidden the body in a cardboard box near a canal. When the police informed Marianne about her daughter's whereabouts and tragic demise, she was devastated. 
However, the trial brought further anguish. Marianne was forced to hear testimonies and descriptions about her life and Anna's, suggesting that Anna was practically raised on the streets and that such an incident was inevitable due to Marianne's negligence as a bar waitress who worked late nights and neglected her daughter. This left Marianne heartbroken and furious, particularly tormented by the possibility that Anna's killer might not receive the maximum penalty due to potential claims of mental health issues, which could allow him to avoid prison. Consequently, Marianne silently began to devise a plan to avenge her daughter's death, regardless of the consequences. During the trial, Klaus Grabowski repeatedly claimed that Anna had seduced and extorted him for money, insisting that his actions were driven by the fear of returning to jail. His defense also centered around the idea that the hormonal treatment he was undergoing significantly affected him and led to violent outbursts. Frustrated and injured by these lies, Marianne decided to buy a gun and secretly practice shooting. Every time Marianne attended the trial, her displeasure was evident, especially when she heard statements that defamed her seven-year-old daughter. At one point, she expressed clear anger, unable to bear listening to Klaus and his lawyer's fabrications. However, the trial took a dramatic turn on its third day, March 6, 1981. Marianne arrived at the courtroom later than usual, entering with an expressionless face. She walked with an upright posture, her hands in the pockets of her white coat. Unbeknownst to others, she had managed to bypass the strict security measures of the judicial establishment with a pistol in her pocket. As the judge and others in the courtroom carried on with the proceedings, Klaus, with his back to Marianne, faced the judge. At this moment, Marianne stood still, her nerves palpable. She seized the opportunity to act when Klaus stood up to give his statement. Marianne pulled out the pistol and fired seven shots, six of which struck Klaus, causing him to collapse. The precision of her shots was noted by many. Marianne remained expressionless throughout, slightly moving her lips as she fired. She made no attempt to flee and did not resist when the courtroom security detained her. Marianne was heard saying, that pig killed my daughter. He shot her in the face, but I shot him in the back. I hope he's dead. Her wish was confirmed when an officer checked Klaus and declared him dead. Upon hearing this, a look of relief crossed Marianne's face, contrasting her previous expressions. However, Marianne now faced her own trial, which would not be easy to escape. Those who witnessed the incident noted that Mariam seemed to be in a trance, struggling to comprehend her actions. The forensic psychiatrist examined her, asking her to write something to analyze her handwriting and mental state. Marianne wrote, I did it for Anna, surrounding the sentence with seven hearts, possibly representing each year of Anna's life. The next day, German newspapers displayed Marianne's photo, dubbing her the Avenging Mother. The case became the most well-known instance of vigilant justice in West Germany, garnering extensive media coverage. Television crews from across Europe rushed to report on the case, highlighting its extraordinary and tragic nature. Marianne was quickly brought to trial for murder. During her trial, she testified that she was not fully aware of her actions, claiming she was in a trance and even had a dream where she saw Anna walking through the courtrooms. She also mentioned her mental health had deteriorated significantly following the events. Marianne then told a lie that likely worsened her standing with the judge. She claimed she had bought the gun to end her own life, but no one believed she hadn't premeditated her actions and practiced with the weapon before using it in court. Many people in Germany and around the world supported Marianne for taking matters into her own hands, as they felt the system had failed by previously freeing Klaus and authorizing his hormonal treatment without proper evaluation. They saw it as fair to set her free. However, there were also those who viewed Marianne as a criminal who had taken justice into her own hands in the worst possible way, labeling her a murderer. 
Others judged her for being an irresponsible mother who had given up her other two children for adoption and committed a cold-blooded crime that could have harmed others in the process. With all this controversy and mixed feelings, Marianne was charged with murder in a judicial process for the death of Klaus Grabowski on November 2, 1982. The prosecution later withdrew the charge, and after 28 days of negotiations, the jury reached a verdict. In March 1983, Marianne was convicted of involuntary manslaughter and illegal possession of a firearm, sentenced to six years in prison. Three years later, the authorities reconsidered, believing she didn't deserve any sentence. Soon after, Marianne sold her life story for about 250,000 German marks in an exclusive to a news magazine, stating she did it to pay off the debts caused by the judicial process. Following the fall of the Berlin Wall, she returned to a now unified Germany after being diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. During this time, Marianne was interviewed by various media outlets, often placed in tense situations with questions comparing her to Klaus, as both were murderers. Despite this, she maintained her composure, stating she did what she did to ensure Klaus faced justice for his actions against the seven-year-old girl, even as he continued to spread lies about her in his final moments. Knowing her illness was terminal, Marianne asked a reporter to accompany her with a movie camera until her last moments. Marianne passed away at the age of 46 on September 17, 1996, from pancreatic cancer. She was buried next to her daughter Anna's grave in the Lübeck Cemetery. And that's the end of today's case. As always, I appreciate your support for my work. If you subscribe, like, and share this video, it will help me continue creating content. This was another episode of Unreal True Crime. See you soon.